Maybe I can start. Hello, Tuomas Sokka from Fingersoft, creative director here. Almost nine years in this company, before that in a few Finnish uh, mobile game companies, including Supercell, and started here as a game artist actually, so got then my way through of making art to criticizing art and <laughs> recruiting artists in our company. So nice to meet you all. I can go. So my name is Dario. Uh, I live, uh, live and work in Germany currently. I'm from Italy. Uh, I'm at Inno Games since 2013. I'm a team lead art on Lost Survivors and my background is a 3D artist. I work in the industry since 2006 and I'm also looking forward to share our talks together with the other guys here. Yeah, maybe I'll go next. Uh, my name is Burkus. Uh, I'm uh, currently situated and from Iceland. I work at Mainframe and I've been in the industry for, I think, just around 20 years, something like that. Studied illustration and then uh, landed in the games industry for a, as a weird coincidence. I worked at CCP for many years and now I'm at a lead artist or lead concert artist at Mainframe. So I'm looking forward to this. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Phil Williams. I'm art director at King. I'm art director for Farm Hero Saga. Um, I'm, I'm a relative newbie compared to everybody else on this panel. Um, my background is I worked for magazines and books and comics for most of my career, for about 15 years working on Disney brands. Um, and a big link with Scandinavia, there's a publishing company called Egmont in uh, Copenhagen, who I was with for, for most of that time, real links with Disney. And I moved out, over to video games relatively recently, only about three years ago. Uh, started off at a company called Supermassive Games, who make narrative horror games. And then massive switch, I mean, from Disney to horror games, and then a massive switch back to something I'm more familiar with, which is that kind of stylized cartoon style of artwork at King, which is where I've been for a couple of years. All right, thank you guys. And uh, next, I think what everyone is waiting for is that uh, I think we got about 100, over 100 portfolios submitted to us by uh, talented artists all over the world uh, who would really like to, uh, to get um, pieces of advice. I'm not sure, or I'm sure we are not gonna be able to go through all the 100 of those. But uh, yeah, we selected some of the portfolios. Um, thank you very much. We did this uh, really randomly. And um, I think we have um, artists now here online with us. So it would be great to basically get, uh, get your opinion and some advices for the artists that took the moment to send the portfolios. And um, this is Hatang, junior 3D artist. And um, the art piece is Banzai work. Let's start, maybe, whoever wants to start. Um, yeah, I think it's actually, I think it's quite a nice piece. I, I quite like it. I think if I were to criticize, I would have liked to see maybe the scale a little bit better. Um, you know, it's a bonsai tree and I, I have a little bit of hard time figuring out the scale. Uh, there's also, uh, I really like, do like the colors and like the floral around the floral arrangements about around it, it has this environment and same with the lighting, I think is, is quite good. Um, I think also a small critique would be to maybe have the, um, uh, the leaf, uh, clusters of leaf, maybe in a different size. Uh, they're all uh, a little bit in the same size. I would have loved to see a little bit more rhythm, like big, medium, small rhythm going on around there, just as a visual pattern, you know, just to break it up and have it more visually interesting. But, you know, otherwise, I think it's a nice piece. Yeah, I, I can add on top uh, of Borkur. Um, I can see also some, some the flowers and the leaves, they're all the same when I saw the breakdown of, of your work. Maybe you could also opt for making, creating a variation on that, so it more, looks more natural. For instance, the daisies are all the same exactly. Uh, you could create two or three variations of them. Um, and uh, as well, something that I notice is the color of the daisies, that you could maybe pick something that can pop better in the composition. Now it's black on black, so it's kind of a hole in the, in the, in the picture, in the composition. 
I've got a question for the panel here, actually, because um, I'm more based in the 2D world. I'm, I've got a bit of experience at Supermassive 3D. How important for seeing something like this for you would it be to see breakdown of UVs and some understanding that the artist uh, knows about the efficiency of polys and making sure the poly counts aren't through the roof? Would you like to see something like that in a portfolio? Uh, yes, uh, definitely, yes. Yeah, and I think for this piece, they were visible in the later later pictures. Yeah, for me, this picture is interesting because it's not just a showcase of this model, but it clearly looks like some kind of statement that, okay, it's evoking a story in me. Like, why is this bonsai tree left here in the middle of a grass field? Is the, is the, is the grass field part of the composition why why is the lighting like this it's it's like quite somber and moody you are in a dark place and somebody forgot their bonsai tree there maybe it's even overgrown not not tended anymore and i'm curious if this was just spontaneous out of the process of uh putting this here and lighting it up or was it a conscious decision from the artist of hey let's let's create a small story out of this piece but uh, whichever the case i think it it's a more interesting piece like this. Mm. That's a really good point. That storytelling that images evoke, <laughs> um, whether intentional or not, it, it would be maybe nice to have a little information about that in that intention. But the fact it has that really magical feel, like you say, it's kind of what's going on here. Why, are they, why is the lighting uh, in a certain way? Was it being highlighted? Is this kind of some magical artifact we're getting towards that's got power? Yeah, it's great to see that, that, tele, that storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think you're right. It has that sort of quality. It feels like, uh, you know, it feels like something. It feels like it's, you know, it's like it has a story there. I totally agree. I think previously when we were looking at this, somebody pointed out that the black, uh, the decision to use the black vase, maybe it gets a little bit drowned in the final render. I'm not sure. Maybe it's intentional that that's not the focal point, but again, something that the artist needs to be conscious of that. Why, why do you choose this black vase if you know that it gets a little bit drowned in, in the final piece? I mean, he did some, some uh, variation. If you scroll uh, up or down, I remember yeah, he tried out different colors. So it would be nice to know why, you pick, uh, why they picked black over something that could pop more. Yeah, it's if you scroll a little bit up, actually. Yeah, if you go up, or like then I think you you'll find the vases. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. I really like these variations. So the question then from the artist is that uh, what is lacking. Uh, in my portfolio that you, uh, what, what is like in there from your point of view, if you were to invite uh, to an interview? Uh, did other guys check the whole portfolio? I can say a few things first. Uh, I think you need to pay attention to materials in your work. I think this is like one of the best pieces in the portfolio. There were others where the materials weren't uh, I wasn't quite sure what it was supposed to be. There was, was a tree that looked a little bit plasticky. In in this piece, for example, I can I can see that the tree itself is like made out of wood, and then the leaves are <laughs> leaves and not plastic or metal. But in the uh, other pieces in your portfolio, there were there were some pieces where the materials were a bit confusing and the lighting was a bit confusing. So you always need to be conscious of what the thing is and what do you want to tell with the piece. Something that I noticed is that, I noticed noticed is that uh, the artist tends to paint the light directly in the textures a lot, like the basket with bread. Um, uh, I noticed that this is something that is, you need to be careful with because, if, uh, especially in 3D, your object being able to work from every point of view. Uh, so unless you are on a 2D environment or a 2D context, uh, context, be careful with that. Like you can also mix up with some shading to make sure that the object reacts properly to light.
Okay, thank you. Let's move on. <clears throat> Next artist is Alexandra. Uh, she is a mid to senior level 2D artist. And uh, yeah, the art piece is a uh, kitty. I'm happy to kind of jump in and start this one off. Um, firstly, I think it's so adorable. It's very cute. Um, you've got this really sweet character here. Um, what I'd like to know is a little bit more about the intention behind it. We've got a very stylized form of artwork, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with stylized art. But what is the stylized artwork uh, intended for? How did you get to this point? So you've got a very simplified representation of a character, almost toy-like. Um, so w what's the route that's led you to, d to make these decisions to get to this point? Um, the other thing as well for character artists, uh, consider turnaround. So consider, uh, I was going to say T poses, but of course you can't do a T pose on a character like this, but make sure you've got those turnarounds. And the reason a turnaround is important is because you're starting to explore some problems that you may not have realized when you first start rendering that character or, or illustrating that character. As soon as you start to turn a character around, you'll, you'll see the bits that maybe you're not thinking about but then you've got some problem solving getting into that as well about the, the form and the shape. So making sure that your character is iconic and stands out. When you turn it around, you'll start to see is there any confusing areas. Um, it's really sweet. There's actually a link I notice as well, which does take you to another page here where you've got um, a few other sketches, a few character sketches. And again, they're very sweet to see. They're very stylized, but I don't understand the intention. So again, there's no indication of this for a mobile game. Is this for, uh, what, what's this gonna be used in? And there's no idea of environment where these characters are gonna live. So again, it's, it's very sweet. I, I love the idea, it's very cute, but I don't really understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just want to throw in here because I'm going through your portfolio and I think your 2D skills are really strong. It's really nice. And I like your, your 2D animals. I can, I can see where this is coming from, like the, the 3D version. Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can sort of see that you're still developing your 3D skills. Um, to catch up with your 2D, like uh, with your 2D skills in a way, uh, I, I think it's going. You know, it's it's obviously working out. Um, yeah, I just wanted to. You know, I think you're on a good path here. It's, but I would. I, I agree. I would have liked to see more of a setting. You know, it's just an object. It's just like one character, and it doesn't really tell you much. Uh, it would have been nice to have some context. You know, and why why this piece? You know, it maybe maybe would have been. I would have liked to see it maybe a little bit more. Yeah, I agree. Please, 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 Thomas. Okay, yeah, I agree with Burkur that uh, in the portfolio I noticed really nice two D uh, pieces, and I noticed also progression from the first pieces down on the page to the middle ones and then the later ones. But that's also another nice point that how do you organize your portfolio? Because the first thing I see in the portfolio is this kitty and then the other like sloth character. And they are super low poly, simple characters without context, without background. So somebody sees your portfolio and those are the things they see first. They, they might get scared like, OK, this is some, something like super, super beginner uh, style, even though you have good fundamentals in 2D. And this, this piece specifically, like uh, Phil said, it's it's a little bit confusing. Is is this a living thing? Is this a doll? Is 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 a cat's personality uh, captured inside something that's not living because it looks quite stiff and and the material doesn't look like soft and fuzzy like in the concept. And you ha you have painted the eyes and the nose and the mouth, and they are catching the same exact light as the body and the head itself. They are not separate materials or. In, in separate groups. So it looks a little bit weird. It's like a toy that's been painted. Maybe that's the point. Something that I can, I would like to add is like, uh, normally when you translate a concept from 2D to 3D, you want to take full advantage of the technique. So here you, you try to make a, make a perfect one, one to one uh, translation and uh, in proportion they got a bit lost and you self-impose yourself a lot of limitations like in the poly count i can see from the side view on the nose on the mouth you could benefit from that more definition at the end of the day since it's not a character for any specific project you could go a bit 
crazy. I mean, the most important thing is that the result is good. So don't set yourself too many limitations on that regard. Cool. Thank you very, very much. Let's move on. This is Alina. She's a mid to senior level uh, concept artist. And uh, this is her art piece, The Burnt Warrior. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll just do a, do a quick. I was looking at this uh, this one earlier, and I, I think it's a nice piece. I like the colors and the design of it, you know, the whole concept and how you're using like these um, shells for the kneecaps and, uh, uh, and same with the, what are these, like some fruit nuts. I don't know. I don't, I don't know the names for the, for the shoulder pads. I think it's very cute and I like it. But I just want to point out that I think the two piece sketches that you have there a little bit below, are really fantastic. I really love these. They're like they feel like they're they're done in like in a minute, and they show that expression of the character. I have to say they show the expression better than the than the fin finished render. So, uh, and I think it's really important when you're uh, when you have concepts like this, uh, is to show the sketches, uh, especially when they're cute like this, to have them accompanied with the final piece, just to see like how the thinking process is, because when you're working in a studio. Uh, you're going to do, be doing like thousands of sketches and only a few rendered pieces. And you're going to be throwing back and forth these sketches uh, among creatives and art director. So it's uh, it's very important to, you know, have that skill down. And it's it's very nice uh, for me if I'm, for example, if I'm hiring someone, I want to see the sketches and I want to see the process that led to that decision. It helps. It definitely helps. And it's just a, it's just good advice. Yeah, 100% agree with Burgur that I had the same point that the sketches are really lively. They actually look more like a hummingbird, which is supposed to be like fast and nimble and light. So this kind of like uh, long sword or even using the beak somehow. The beak is like the biggest thing you see in a hummingbird. So why is this bird assassin not using uh, his beak? And, and the final guy is a little bit stiff. So mm -hmm. definitely great that these sketches are here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It could be dual wielding a sword and to speak, you know, that could be. I'd, I'd reiterate exactly what you both said. I love seeing those initial sketches. Um, it's one of the challenges artists always have is that you have so much life and energy in those initial roughs that you come out with. They flow out of you and you, you then you, you kind of lose that. It's the eternal battle. If, as soon as you start to clean that up, sometimes you lose that. Uh, so seeing those background sketches, that's advice for everybody, I think. Um, I know that's one of the questions I think that a lot of people say is, well, what do I put in my portfolio? Obviously, put your best work in. If there's something that you don't think is your best, don't put it in. Um, be, be very brutal with your artwork. Think about your best. But if your character sketches or your poses or your thought process, your exploration is something that you think is really valuable and, and gets that intention across, then absolutely include that because it really helps us understand that intention and where some of that may get a little lost in the final piece. Um, I also like to reiterate what we're saying. I think it's really, uh, I love the seeds and the, the natural uh, inspiration for the character. So it's great to be able to see where that's come from. I think it's really important to include that. But yeah, keep, keep those sketches and it shows so much energy in life. If I may be the devil's advocate a little bit, uh, I, I would like to to add something on Phil. Um, yeah, I, I agree that you should always put your best work but sometimes I also like to see the progression or, or, or the evolution of a person. So maybe something that is a bit old that you may say is not the, my best work, but it's important for me to show the curve of progression on a, on a portfolio. Because otherwise, if I just have a snapshot of you right now, I don't know your potential. Mm. So there's another way of thinking. You know, maybe. Yeah, so. it's a balance, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, tough balance. And make sure to put the recent stuff or, or the best stuff in the front page of the art station because sometimes, sometimes I uh, w once I reviewed a portfolio of a person who applied to our company and I was like really weirded out by the portfolio and it ended up that they had turned in their settings so that it's the opposite, the oldest stuff was on the front and the latest stuff was was on the bottom so that was a really confusing thing. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Uh, I think it's it's actually a good rule, is that with visual with an visual image, you have about zero point three seconds to capture somebody's attention before they move on to the next thing. 
So it's like it's very important to get that like that working instantly. That initial thumbnail image it needs to like sell it in a way. Yeah, some some of us might get like hundreds and bigger studios, even thousands of applications from artists in positions, and you cannot like deep dive into every portfolio. So the couple of first pieces need to be really good for the yes. person to then dig deep. Thank you very much. We will move on to the next portfolio, but um, <clears throat> Aline asked us um, for maybe one advice because she wants to grow as a concept artist. What to include in the portfolio as a, if you want to grow as a concept artist? Just one advice from each. I could well, I can say for me, sorry, if I can go. Um, I will see a bit more production ready concepts. I feel like you have a lot of artistic pieces, like some stuff that could be a, a background in an illustration, but I miss a bit like 3D ready uh, concept to be used. Um, that would be my first advice. Yeah, I can go. I was thinking that this is a little bit more of an illustrator's portfolio than concept artist because your concepts need to always serve 3D artists, writers, game designers, everybody who's working in the team. So the concept cannot be super flat or super vectorized, of course, in some projects, maybe. And then you need to think about the materials. For example, one in one image, you had lots of plants. And then the lighting in the plant was uniform. So the leaves and then the hard like roots were lit the same. So you need to think about what materials those are. And that helps the 3D artists later on. I can jump in with some, some thoughts from a 2D perspective. Um, actually, very similar to what we've said so far. Uh, think of the intention of what, what these concepts are serving. So what I see in your portfolio is a really beautiful understanding of light. Uh, there's some some great uh, light explorations in your broader portfolio. Um, what I'd be interested in, maybe some breakdowns of taking some of those props, because you've got some stylized images there, which are really good for thematic inspiration, which is, of course, part of a concept artist's role. But maybe digging deeper into why have I got these plants in a certain way? Do I have a mood board of plants that I can show or um, other environments as well? You've got a few environments in there, but you've also got a lot of separate characters, and I'm not seeing so much of here's a character and here's the environment and why I've uh, explored that, what the concept is actually trying to tell tell the um, the audience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I don't really have much to add. I think you said it all, but it's, I think it's, you have a beautiful style going on here. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's very, uh, it's you're you're definitely getting there. Cool. Let's move on. Carlo, you said 3D hard surface uh, slash uh, prop artist, and uh, he is requesting to review the British tank challenger. Shall I go? Okay. Uh, I think that I, I'm not very familiar with the tank, the real, or like based on. Uh, average experience on this kind of assets. I feel like uh, the model is good, looks, looks good overall, um, but I miss a little bit of the small details here and there on the surface. The, the is too perfect for me. Like I miss a lot of balls. Uh, I, 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 this tank looks like it was molded basically. Um, and a bit of abuse of the edge map in a Substance Painter. I can clearly see on the Canon. On the on a lot of edges, you just slap the edge map on it. Uh, we, uh, you should always work that afterwards to make sure that it's not equally spread all over the place. The worn is always different in different parts of the of the tank, so this uh, is taking away a lot of realism on the surfacing. Uh, but overall, the model is good. I wish I could see the high poly model. Uh, that's something you should put in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just if I chime in here, I think it's, you know, I think it's a beautiful model, um, you know, uh, beautiful 3D model. I, I mean, I, I'm, I bet it's very accurate as well. Um, I would have loved to see, you know, like, uh, like you mentioned, I would have loved to see a little bit more character in it. And also, I, I would have personally wanted to see a little bit of an environment as well. It's a little bit, you know, just seeing the prop 
it's a little bit sterile. I mean, it's only going to help you if you if you put your prop into an environment and light it and sell sell it in a way. I mean, imagine if you're like if you're selling a product and you just like have the product there with a great background. It's like nobody's really going to look at it. But if you put some cool lighting on it and you know have some sparkles and gizmos, then it's like it's going to help the product to sell. Uh, and I think that's missing a little bit in your portfolio. And uh, I will try to like concentrate a little bit on that as well. Yeah, this realistic hard surface modeling, that this is the toughest one for me because I, I haven't done it almost at all. But uh, I agree with uh, Burkur that it, it would be really helpful to see this in a game engine, for example. Just put it in Unreal Engine or Unity or somewhere, download a scene for free and put it there. Let's see how it looks in proper lighting and in-game restrictions. And then you have a lot, some light, nice like dirt maps there, some uh, dried up sand or mud, but it's not 100% uh, logical because there's lots of it on the sides of the tank and then on top, it's almost like perfectly clean. But of course, tiny details, but that sells the realism, those tiny details. Yeah, if I can just jump in as well, is I think uh, someone mentioned about it being slightly sterile. I, first of all, it's it's a beautiful model. I think it's, um, Again, I don't know about vouching for the accuracy, but it, it does look um, really, you can see the quality that's gone into the work there. But there's some of those edges, you can tell the artificial edges. So where there's that wear, wear and tear, it was very much um, identical all the way around. And again, getting back to what we mentioned on previous portfolios, a bit of storytelling in here. So I think it links to that, uh, where's that, those um, dirt maps. Well, why is there dirt there? And why is it all in the same direction? It's been blasted by wind, maybe. And maybe you can even think about it's been trundling through the desert, so all the sand will be going in a certain direction. But how about some bullet holes? This um, this tank doesn't seem like it's very grubby, but it hasn't seen any action. Could we maybe have a spray of bullet holes along the side or something to indicate a little bit of storytelling to take away from that slight sterility of it? Yeah, it's kind of kind of funny. I was just thinking that you were talking about the storytelling, and it's kind of interesting with storytelling. Uh, uh, a nice advice is to put something in there you don't expect, because that always invokes a story in people. For example, if you would put like footprints on top of the tank, you know that would already like indicate that people have been like moving on top of it, getting into the hats and something like that. Just like these small things, it really would help sell the concept. Mm -hmm. And you know, just just as an example, and I just wanted to uh, also throw out there, because you're doing props and you're like you're a prop artist and you're specializing on props. I recommend checking out a lecture uh, on YouTube by a, a guy called Mike Hill. Um, and he has this really interesting lecture about uh, industrial design and props in games and movies. And I, I, I couldn't recommend it more. It's one of the better lectures I've seen. And I think it would be useful for you. Let's move on then. This is Paul. He's a senior 3D character. Uh, and this is the art piece uh, he has to review. And there's also the small video. Yeah, this was really interesting to me. The portfolio as a whole, it was like really high quality. And you have done like album covers and film posters and everything. So you have you are obviously already like established on the field. But for this piece, there, there was a couple of things that was bothering me. It's like a beautiful piece, very warm feeling, warm lighting. I, I can imagine myself in that scene, but, but a couple of things. So if it's that bright outside and you are looking from inside of that scene, then, then the interior, interior should be a little bit more contrasty. So a little bit darker. And then in the video, you are being pulled by, I assume, by horses, and it's quite fast, it's quite bumpy, but then you have teacups, and then you have cards, you have lots of little props everywhere. I would say that all of those would be on the floor uh, in little pieces if this was a real carriage. And then one thing that this uh, character is modeled really well, but a little bit too much focus with the golden ratio on the rear, I would say. And then when the smoke also is there, then that, that kept stealing my attention. And I don't think that was the uh, intention of the artist here. Yeah, it's that clarity of composition, isn't it? It's um, 
it's uh, the term legibility is something that's a really important one to think about. What's legible for the audience when they're looking at this? And that, um, what is it, like the, the little uh, burning stick in the foreground, you almost don't notice the stick because it's brown against a dark brown background. The glowing ember at the end and the smoke uh, aligned. There's almost a tangent with the edge of the skirt. And then you've got that smoke going across and then hitting that glow, um, the, the rim light at the edge of the skirt. And it's a little confusing because your attention is actually drawn towards the window and the character at the top. And then you subconsciously notice there's something moving slightly below. So anything that's going to be slightly confusing about that, uh, simply maybe moving the, the stick slightly to the left and creating a little bit more negative space would help with that. Uh, but that was a really good point about the lighting. We were doing something in Supermassive Games where we had really bright outsides and then the insides deliberately were supposed to be very, very dark. And of course, that's the intention of the game because it's a horror game. Uh, so there's going to be a, a challenge there, really, of how you replicate that natural lighting. But without losing all that beautiful rendering, the detail you've got in this scene is amazing. Uh, it really dr draws you into that world. You can see how much thought has gone into this. And I loved the work in pro progress video that's slightly below this as well, where it shows the build-up of that, that environment. Really beautiful stuff. Yeah, totally agree. I think it's a beautiful piece. And I like I like mentioned earlier, all the detail is, you know, it's stellar. You know, for example, the glass, just the curvature of the glass panes, so the light reacts differently to all the panels. Um, you know, all these like small things. And then in the animation, the, uh, the window is like opening a little bit and then closing. So it's like everything is moving around. <laughs> and I really do totally agree with the teacup. It would have been nice to see it like, you know, go a little bit, you know, around on the table or something like that than maybe hitting a rock and you know getting a bit bumpy there or something like that but you know it's it's great work i i love this piece yeah it's a great piece overall uh, totally totally super good I, the only thing that's setting me a bit off is the uh, clothes uh, the shirt especially that the wrinkles are a bit i don't know stiff to me i will uh, the, that's the only thing that is drawing my attention uh, otherwise everything looks great so Question from Jamie. I would like to know what things uh, I'm missing in a portfolio, uh, or should I include uh, uh, more environments, uh, species um, uh, to like, <clears throat> or is there anything that is needed in my art to uh, kind of um, to, to be at the standard for the like? Yeah, the, well, basically, the what, yeah, you're asking, you're asking what's missing, and uh, yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're really on a good, you know, on a good roll here. I'm also looking at another piece, uh, which is probably your most recent one, the forest shelter, and I really love the storytelling in that. Um, you know, you have props in there that you know you wouldn't expect, you know, from a forest shelter, and I like that. It sort of shows that there's like a lot of thought has gone into it um i really have a hard time critiquing it because i think you know this is it's good work um, i guess the question we could push back actually to jamie is what is it you want to do so who do you want to work for what's the what's your what's your kind of ideal studio and what kind of games are they making and are you representing that in your portfolio the answer might be yes so you might actually have the style. You might be like, okay, I love Red Dead Redemption. That's the kind of game I want to work for. Um, but if you're, if you want to work on on war games, you need to have more hard surface in there, of, of vehicles or whatever. But make sure that what you want to do and the company you're applying for, you're representing that. Um, it, I, it's key advice for for everybody is, yes, tailor your portfolio to the company you're applying for. There's no point in applying to King to work on Candy Crush if all you've got is tanks and guns. Um, and likewise, if you're going to apply elsewhere and all you've got is stylized cartoon art and you're looking at something that's 3D, well, make sure that you're showing the studio their kind of art. Totally agree. Uh, I will say do your homework. Like when you apply to a company, make sure that, uh, I would not say tailor your portfolio, tailor the company you are applying for. Like pick the right companies, show that you know what you are applying for and don't use a shotgun approach. That would be just detrimental. Yeah, I think we had Jamie's question here, but it doesn't matter. It, it was relevant to Paul as well, I'm pretty sure. Because the portfolio looks quite specific. Like it's it's high-end stuff, high-concept stuff. 
for for example, for my company, uh, we, we have lots of low poly stylized stuff. So this portfolio is not like a good match. But if I think about like a game company like Ninja Theory, their game like Xenia looks 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 pretty similar to me already. So mm. actually, so yeah, apologies. The feedback was actually for Paul, and I'm just thinking as well, looking at this, uh, I've noticed Supermassive Games are looking for environment artists right now. Um, send them your portfolio for sure. They're working on a project and I don't know what it is. I'm no longer at the company, so they don't tell me secrets anymore. But there's a new project kicking off and I know the, um, the lighting director there and he's looking for environment artists, so send it to them. Thank you very much. And uh, Paul, if you listen to us, sorry, it was Paul, it wasn't Jamie. Sorry, it's just my notes. I'm sorry. Now we move on to the Jamie's portfolio and uh, Jamie is a 2D uh, concept artist, uh, visual developer, and uh, his uh, art piece is this. It's uh, Clemente concept. I guess I can jump in on this. This is 2D yeah. stuff, so this is my world. Um, your portfolio in general, actually, I had a look through it, and uh, you've got you've got this really interesting indie style going on. It's kind of quite gritty. It almost feels like fanzine art. I love it. Um, so you've got a voice, but this is great. But what I'm thinking of is it actually it relates to what we were just talking about. It's considering the needs of the studio that you're approaching. So absolutely, as we said, there's that balance between what a studio needs, but also what you want to do as an artist. And if this is the stuff you want to do, that's great. But make sure that you're uh, targeting the studios that have this kind of art style, or if you're kicking off an indie project of your own and this is the style you want to develop. Um, so looking at this piece of art, again, it's similar to what I've mentioned. You've got some turnarounds here, which is great. It's always good to see when you've got concept artwork of characters, see those turnarounds. Um, what you're maybe not exploring so much here is some of the problems you might have with those shapes. So you've done the turnarounds, and now you can start to see there's some problems with, well, how is the arm actually going to move? This is presumably going to be an animated character at some point. And you've got a, 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 a kind of conical shaped dress, and the arms are sitting like this. So. With this turnaround, you've got an option to explore those problems. This is your um, problem-solving laboratory, as you, if you think of it in that way. So think about some poses as well. It's not the opposite of earlier where turnarounds were missing, but here actually we're missing some action poses. You've got your turnarounds, you've got your character. How is it going to look in action? Um, think about that negative space, so where those arms maybe need to stick out a little and you can have that legibility between them. And then kind of the final thought as well is, don't forget about perspective. This is two-dimensional artwork perspective, super important to sell depth within that art. So if you look at that bottom row, I think it's the third one along, that hand, whether they're out, it would be bigger and towards us and maybe slightly lower or slightly higher, depending on where the trajectory of that arm is standing out a little, but it's very flat at the moment. So think about your perspective of that character as well. Yeah, overall in the portfolio, you have a really distinctive, cool, like comic book style uh, that can be a strength it can also be a weakness if, if you are not exploring other styles then for example in game companies it might might be tough to land a job because you need to find a project that uses very similar style that you are so strong with so uh, consider experimenting on styles and I would say that it's again a little bit of an illustrator's portfolio because in the pieces I couldn't find that many sketches or even text description of what's what's the assignment, what's this supposed to be. So you are just left there uh, with the images. And for this one that we are now looking at, I think the version in the website was really low res. I wanted to like zoom out and see see the face closer, but well, maybe it was my computer, but it seemed to be really low res. And for this image, it's tough for me to see where the characters like body and anatomy ends and where the clothing begins. Is, is that dress like supported by some kind of wires or something? And more sketches and text would help me in understanding this character more. Yeah, yeah you go. I was just going to say, have a look on the internet, find some references of Disney's explorations from the from from anything up until well up until now. But look at the the the, the classic stuff from the 1940s and 50s, and you'll see all those explorations about body form underneath cat clothing, the movement of clothing. That stuff is timeless. You can learn so much from just Google it. There's some beautiful books out there as well, which are great to have as well. But um, uh, 
see what you can find. There's Walt Mitfield who wrote a wonderful book. Um, I'm trying to find it. Uh, Drawn to Life. What? Um, that's it. I will hold it up. I've got it right here. Do some talking while I dig out the book and I'll hold it up as a reference for people. Yeah, I also have the book and it's great. And also one point, the whole portfolio was almost in black and white. So definitely explore and challenge yourself in creating something with just color and light. Here we go. Apologies. It's Walt Stanchfield. It's drawn to life. It's Walt used to do these drawing sessions at Disney back in the 50s. And these are his notes from those evening drawing classes. And it's got some beautiful stuff in form movement, legibility, um, stuff that this kind of art style could really benefit from. Uh, I also would recommend to put more references, more exploration into your concepts. Like here, I see the concept turnaround with a, uh, basically the color scheme is just uh, switching the same colors, uh, top to bottom, hair to clothes. Uh, and I don't know why she's wearing that dress uh, with that, these colors. So maybe you could also think to explore something different to help readability. If I imagine this character in a more top-down environment, uh, the white legs will be disturbing a lot. So also work with the values, like to make sure that you have the right attention to the main elements of the character. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I totally agree what you guys have been saying. I, I love the style, um, but it's, yeah, it's going to be hard to get a, do get a job at a big studio. Uh, just with these, uh, you know, it's, it's you have a very strong voice, but it's a little bit singular. I uh, would love to see, um, you know, more variety in there. And maybe a little bit of process as well. And we actually have a question from Jamie. Uh, should I include more environments and pieces in my portfolio to show that I'm capable of perspective, anatomy, etc.? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. That's a hard yes. <laughs> Indeed. Very nice. Very concrete. Thank you. We move on. And uh, this is Alex. He's a junior lighting artist. Uh, and he's looking for his first job in the, in the industry. And uh, as far as I understood that some of the pieces he bought from the Unreal Engine marketplace, but he's looking for uh, for the start in the industry as a lightning artist. Yeah, again, not my super expertise, but I have to say that uh, the lighting from outside, because it looks like in the outside it's night and it's a big city, there's lots of city lights there, that really doesn't match what's coming inside this tram. Quite soft and cozy lighting inside the tram. Like the guy there is almost fully lit from all, all directions with really soft light, especially his, his head. So try to figure out like what's the mood of this picture. You are in a tram or a subway and you are going through like this, I don't know, cyberpunk city. So, so the lighting should be more harsh. And then the posing for the girl, for the for the woman, the main character is like, that's pretty stiff. I don't I don't think anybody would sit like that in the in the tram. Uh, probably you have posed the character because you want to show the cool model, of course, and then the lighting. But uh, it, that looks a little bit painful to me. Yeah, plus one on what Thomas said. Uh, definitely. Uh, gives more character to the lighting. Like at the moment, it's everything like uh, studio lighting almost, uh, pretty much. I will go for more acid colors and more, like you see the guy playing the violin, you should just get a couple of windows projected to him uh, and nothing else. So you could enhance the face, the, put someone draws some the attention of the violin and a, a bit more drama to the scene. Otherwise, it is very cozy and uh, almost in-house. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. It's I, th I think the biggest issue is uh, the lighting, uh, like you said. It it just doesn't really work, when, especially, I mean, for example, when you look at the violin player, I don't really understand, you know, it wouldn't be lit like that. It would be soft light. Uh, you would have a soft light on him because of the multiple lights within the tram and, you know, multiple sources from outside. So it would be you know, more wacky. There would be more shadow areas inside the tram. It, it, it needs more contrast and grittiness and like more, 
things going on there. But yeah, maybe it could benefit from a, some kind of statement. Um, it's that, yeah, it's got that cyberpunk feel to it. Maybe think of the, have a look at some reference of film noir lighting. Uh, the classic noir lighting is the, um, the jail cell bars um, contrasted against someone's face. So you've got those cuts. So maybe having some kind of diagonals that cut across that player, something that gives that impression that maybe the light is moving through the train or that there's a, there's a real contrast going on, something that's got a little bit more drama in it. Um, there's something going on with the sweater as well, which I wasn't quite under sure, sure what it is. I don't know whether it's the, the actual color or the design of the sweater, but when you and the trousers as well, there's some sort of diagonal. I don't know whether that artifact's going on, but there's a few little strange color um, things going on. I don't know if that's intentional or if it's something that needs to be looked into as well. Yeah, and, yeah, go ahead. I just want to throw in there uh, really quick. It would have been nice to have like one. Uh, more of a focus light in there, um, you know, whether that's inside the tram or coming in from the outside, because there are so many like multiple light sources. It's a little bit confusing. There's like it lacks focus and direction. It's always keep it simple, stupid. It's a valuable rule in like in life, <laughs> you know, just like focus on the things that matter and, you know, don't worry about the rest. Well, OK, worry about the rest, but you get my point. Yeah. Very good rule. We are stupid indeed. And uh, one more thing about uh, your portfolio in general. You have a couple of studies there of uh, movie scenes, how they are lit, and then you have made it in Unreal or something yourselves. And those are really nice. And I think this scene in particular would benefit from something like that. Because it's such a good reference to take some kind of movie scene, see how they have lit it. Because they have indeed lit it a little bit like 3D artists, they have to think of about every light that they put there, that they tell the story, they light up the necessary parts that tell the story. So using something like this for this scene, revisiting this scene would probably help you a lot. Cool, thank you. I think uh, quite a few uh, very practical advices to Alex. This is Jimmy. He's a mid to senior 3D environment artist, uh, and uh, he would like to know how to make his portfolio to stand out. But this is the art piece uh, that he, select, he asked to, to review. It's super atmospheric, isn't it? Yeah, cool. absolutely. I got the fear going on. It's like, I don't want any jump scares right now. <laughs> um, I'd love to know the intention. Um, it's, it's similar to comments that we've said to previous um, portfolios. Uh, what's the platform for this? Because there's, you can see there's some, some kind of lo slightly low poly stuff going on, which is fine, but I, I'd want to know what, where's this, what's this for? What's the, uh, what's the intention for, for the player for this? Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, no, I was going to chime in. I really like the, uh, you know, how atmospheric it is. I like the lighting that's, uh, that's uh, going in there. Um, I would have wanted to see, I think what's bothering me a little bit is uh, what often happens in 3D is that when is the meeting of surfaces. And it's a very common problem. It's like when, for example, when the walls meets the uh, meets the ceiling and you know when when the all these like th all these uh, props are like meeting in all the edges it's often a good rule to try to break up and and do something with the edges in 3d because um, edges in 3d they all they so often look artificial and sterile and boring whereas in real life you have much more going on in edges uh, often edges they have just this really uh, detailed minuscule beveled edge on them and it really helps to sell um, you know realism because nothing in real life has a hard edge you know nothing nothing has you know an edge that goes like this and meets like this and has like a 100% 90 ankle and it really 
um, gives it that like old 3D look, uh, you know, and 3D artists, I'm not, I mean, I'm more of a 2D artist, but, you know, I've done a little bit of 3D and this was one of the first things that I learned, you know, is try to soften up these edges a little bit and do something, put shadow in there, put something in there, dirt, anything, anything to break it up. Yeah, it's uh, because clearly this tries to be a, re a fairly realistic scene, scenery, in, in my opinion. I, I don't, it, it doesn't feel like stylized to me. So when you go for realism, then you, you got to nail down some certain boxes. Th these days, it's easy to do the lighting so that you have the um, ambient occlusion. And that, that helps with the uh, edges as well because now lots of the surfaces look like they are plastic or they are separated from other surfaces that they are not, not in the same lighting scene. And same for the materials. A lot of the materials feel a little bit out of place, plastic, plasticky. Like you, you look at the scene and you have a table of wood, you have uh, chairs of wood, then you have kitchen appliances and maybe you have like marble or something. So they should all feel a little bit different, but in some scenes here, in some pictures, they look that they are lit the same. Yeah, sometimes you, you even feel like some objects, they do not have any material to, to them. Uh, I, I, you're relying a lot on the lighting to cover up certain things, like to, to still give the right vibe to the scene. But it's always good to have the scene, let's say, to work correctly uh, as it would be lit uh, in a more flat way. Then using the lighting on top of that, but not to, to just to cover that. Okay, oh, this table doesn't have a texture on it. Uh, I just keep it dark. Uh, so, I got a question for the panel based on this as well. So, uh, this is a really heavily populated environment. There's a lot of props going on here. Would you like to see in a portfolio like this a separate breakdown of all those props as well, so you can see all those different elements that have gone in to create this? Indeed, yes. Okay, and also uh, a second thing as well as. I don't know the background of this, and it could be that this is an individual project. I mean, there's a lot going on, so it's a lot of work. So congratulations if that is. But this is for a recommendation that teamwork is really important within the game world. You're very rarely going to work on something in isolation unless you're on a very, very small indie project. So celebrate that teamwork. If you collaborated on a project, and this is this example or any other where it's actually a joint, um, a joint work, tell that tell that story that this is the project but actually i worked on this element and the other parts worked on somebody else that's going to be really valuable for for a studio looking at that. you're able to do that and that you have that experience also my recommendation is when you when you create a scene like that you decide showing all the props is to show also the, the scene unlit so you can see the texture work uh, you can really appreciate that because otherwise a lot of stuff gets lost uh, simple, simple as that yeah, this reminds me a little bit of those indie horror games in, in Steam. I've, I've been playing some of them and usually they have similar problems in the lighting that I'm not really sure where I'm supposed to go and with which items I'm supposed to interact with. A little bit similar thing here. Everything kind of looks like I can interact with them. And when, when you take a screenshot like this or when you have a scene, you need to really be conscious of like, what am I supposed to be looking at? What am I supposed to be interested at? If it's the whole scene, then that, that's a different thing. But if, if I'm supposed to be interested in the sofa, maybe this is the good lighting for that because my eyes are keeping are, are going in the middle of those two lights to the sofa. I don't know if it's important. Yeah, it's, uh, that's a really good point, actually. That's um, one of those, uh, those gameplay um, tricks that lighting teams and designers put in within the games. I remember seeing it so, I, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but really noticing it in Last of Us 2, where it's it's a linear progression, as we know, but the light was always guiding me to where I needed to go. The, the way those scenes were so beautifully lit, there was always that signifier for me as a player looking at something that could be overwhelming, but actually look for the light point and you know that's where I've got to go next. Yeah, Phil, Phil you have a beautiful mind. I was thinking of Last of Us 2 uh, when looking at this, because that game has very complex scenes where you are inside buildings that have lots of like furniture and stuff mm. but you always know what is important and what's not you just yeah. ignore everything that's not important and it's mostly done by the materials and lighting which is phenomenal in that game oh, i love that you said i got a beautiful mind that made me worth getting up today that's brilliant <laughs> <laughs> all right guys with this i don't think that uh, i'm going to apologize to 
many other artists who send their beautiful portfolios. I think we, uh, this is now excellent time to answer a few questions. We got so many. I will copy those questions and we'll ask you to basically respond to them later. But um, here's one. Do you value seeing a wide style range uh, in a portfolio or a specialization preferred? Um, I, yeah, personally, yeah, <laughs> for me, I, I like to see a little bit of both, but I would say style racks higher, but that's just maybe a personal choice. I don't know, but I, you know, I like to see like a, a voice, but I also like to see, you know, um, one, I don't like seeing one trick ponies either. You know, so you have to have a variation within your style is maybe what I'm trying to say, if that makes sense. I would even try and go like 70, 30, like 70, your style, main style, and then 30, like a bit to yeah. see, to show that you can do something else uh, or, or also. Again, it's, it, we've mentioned it previously, but think about who you're applying to. First of all, I think someone's panel said as well, what do you want to do? So make sure it's an art style and it's a company that's doing the, the, the kind of work you want to do. And then make sure that you're demonstrating that you can do that. So having a, it's, there's no problem with being a generalist and having a broad style, that's, that's something that's commendable. But make sure that you are focusing and you're showing that studio that has a specific style that you want to, to promote. That's the first thing they notice, really sell that. Yeah, if, if you can nail down more than one style in a, and they look good, that's always impressive. It tells me that you have done a lot of explorations and that's hard. It's usually we all have our strengths and we like to keep in, uh, stay in that strength and stay in that area. So if you have mastered a couple of different styles already, that's, that's already impressive to me. But depends on the quality always. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can look at it like that. If you're if you're exploring a new style or experimenting, which I think every artist should do, I think you know it's very important to not uh, get stuck uh, in a certain style and always be doing that and you know fall into this comfort zone. I've seen that many times in the industry that people fall into a comfort zone, and then they just keep on doing that again and again and again and again, and then they at some point you know it's just like. Um, they become obsolete in a way. So I think it's very important to always be seeking out uh, experimenting, new experimentations and maybe don't look at it. Uh, I wouldn't look at it as inventing a new style. I would be, I would look at it as, you know, getting a new tool in your toolbox in a way, you know, you're just figuring out new problem solving ideas and to, to tackle another problem in a way. Uh, general portfolio question. How should you organize the portfolio? We touched this a little bit, but some say that you should keep older work, lower quality to show progression, while some say that you should only show your best work. What is your thoughts about it? Yeah, it's a tricky balance. If you want to show some of your older work that you are not that happy anymore with, don't, don't put too many in them. So when I see all your work in one page, if I see progression there, that's that's nice. But if you put too many of your old work there and the full page is full of your student work, then that can really deter a recruitment person. So to, uh, to add a bit of what I said before, uh, when I said you should also put some work that is not your best, I don't mean to flood your portfolio with that. I just say, if you if you end up having two pieces because this is only your best work, I mean, only two pieces is not enough to judge a portfolio. Uh, so you don't fall into that trick. Yeah, I think it's I think it's also uh, kind of important, you know, if when you're hiring and when you're going through portfolios, um, I I really appreciate it when I can see everything in only a few images. You know, I can see exactly what this artist is about in maybe. I mean, I'm I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw you know anime you know seven images out there you know or something or you know don't take that number as a you know please throw as many as you can in there but you know don't oversaturate with your portfolio with bad things you know you should always and i would say try to get to the uh, try to stick with to the good to the good stuff you know there's really no reason to show your bad sense you know unless you really feel the need to it, it can be really confusing because yeah there's there is a balance and it's a tricky balance um so um 
I guess, as Darius said, it's it can be really useful for us to see that progression and see that you've grown. But if you're looking at your art and you're thinking, well, I've only got uh, seven pieces, so I'll stick a couple more in, even though I, I'm not happy with them and I don't like them, don't put them in. If you don't no. like them and you don't think they're up to scratch, definitely don't put them in. If you've got something from a few years ago, we're artists and it, we're self-critical. I know that it's difficult because we always look at what we did last week and think, I wish I could have done it better. Um, so that's why it's a tricky bit of advice to give because we're always going to be critical of our past. But if you look at work that you did a year or two years ago and you think, well, this is great. I can show it shows a progression to where I am now, but I'm still I still stand by what I did two years ago. I would do it differently now, but I'm not ashamed of it. I don't think it's ashamed is a strong word. Uh, I think it's OK, then include it. But if there's something where you're questioning, well, I'm putting this in because I don't have any artwork and environments and this is not great, but I'll put it in anyway. Don't put it in. Work on something that's better and put that in when you're ready. 100% agree. Thank you. I would like to thank you, guys. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Borkur. Thank you, Dario. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very, very much. I copied all the questions and we'll find a way to, to answer those. I'll pass those over to you. But with this being said, thank you so much, guys, for being with us here today. Thank you. It's been a thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks, guys. It was really fun. <laughs>